In this video, we're going to be taking a look at graphs of normal probability distributions. And the first thing I'd like to do is to kind of compare and contrast um, the binomial probability distribution and the normal probability distribution. Any probability distribution tells us about the shape of the distribution that we're dealing with. They tell us how the probabilities are distributed out into different um, categories for the random variable that we're dealing with. And the binomial probability distribution is used for a binomial random variable, which by definition is a discrete random variable. Okay, so it's used for a discrete random variable, um, specifically the number of successes in n trials. And the shape of the overall graph is controlled by n, the number of trials, and lowercase p, which is the probability of success on any given trial. So those two values together control the shape of the graph of a binomial probability distribution. Now the normal is still a probability distribution, so it still tells us how probabilities are essentially parsed out for different values of the random variable that we're dealing with. But the difference between, or one of the main differences, between the binomial and the normal, the binomial is a discrete probability distribution. The normal, by contrast, is used for continuous random variables. Okay, so it's the difference between a discrete probability distribution and a continuous probability distribution. Also, where the shape of the graph in the binomial is controlled by two values, n and p, two parameters there, for the normal, the shape of the graph is controlled by mu and sigma. Okay, so a little bit of a, a difference in parameters there. N and P for the binomial, mu and sigma, the population mean and the population standard deviation for the normal. Other names that the normal distribution goes by, it can just be called the normal distribution. And really there, if you're going to talk about the normal distribution, normal should be capitalized to distinguish it from the way that we use the word normal in everyday speech. The normal distribution is referring to one particular thing, so it should be capitalized. It can also be called the Gaussian distribution. After um, Carl Friedrich Gauss. Or the, the kind of informal name that you frequently hear it referred to as, is as the bell curve. So if you've ever been in a class where you've been studying things that follow a bell curve, what you were talking about was the normal distribution, whether or not anybody mentioned that at the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the shape of this distribution, uh, because it's called the bell curve, it has a, a characteristic bell shape to it. And I will do the best job that I can drawing this for you. Um, there are really nice pictures of it in your book if you want to take a look at those. But the idea, well that wasn't so bad. The idea with the bell curve is that it is a unimodal and perfectly symmetric distribution, ideally. It has that kind of main hump in the middle and then these thinner tails out to either side. Now this main hump part will be centered at mu so the population mean will be right in the center there. And then from the mean, typically we measure outward in units of standard deviation. So this first tick mark here would be the mu minus one standard deviation. We would have a tick mark at mu minus two standard deviations. 
and a tick mark at mu minus three standard deviations. That tends to be a common way to label these. Similarly, when we go to the right, we have mu. This would be mu plus one standard deviation. Then we would have a tick mark at mu plus two standard deviations and mu plus three standard deviations. Some key features of the graphs of normal probability distributions. Thing one, the line is a smooth line or continuous that is symmetric around mu. So smooth and continuous there just means you can draw the whole line without having to pick your pencil up off the paper and it doesn't have any jagged pointy parts. It's a nice smooth, no holes, no missing parts, um, and it is symmetric with respect to mu. Both sides are identical. The highest point is directly above mu. So directly above the value of the population mean. The graph has an asymptote at the x-axis, specifically a horizontal asymptote at the x-axis. And if it's been a while since you've taken a class where you talked about asymptotes, all that means is if we were to continue this graph all the way infinitely to the left, which this does keep going all the way to the left and all the way to the right. If we were to keep extending it out, the graph would approach the x-axis. It would get closer and closer and closer and closer to going completely flat, but it would never actually touch the x-axis and it would never cross the x-axis. The same is true if we followed the graph forever to the right. It would never touch the x-axis and it would never cross the x-axis. Other key features, as sigma, or the standard deviation, increases, the graph spreads out and gets less moundy. Moundy there, not actually a technical term. But the idea is if we were to increase the sigma value, what you would see happen is this peak would start to squash down. It would get less tall, and more of that area that's up here would go out into the tails. So the tails would get thicker, and the peak would come down. As the value of sigma decreases, the curve becomes more peaked around mu. As sigma decreases, the curve becomes more peaked around mu. So again, what you would see there is if we were to take this graph and decrease the value of sigma, what you would see happen is there would be less area in the tails. This entire thing would smoosh in and the graph would get essentially taller and thinner um, as it went up there. Okay, so those are some of the key features. Oh, sorry, there's one more key feature. The graph has inflection points at mu plus or minus sigma. And inflection points, that's usually a term that we use in calculus. So if you've not taken a calculus course, um, you've likely never heard of inflection points before. So let's talk a little bit about the concept of inflection points. You don't actually need a calculus background to understand what inflection points do. If we go back up here to this graph, here are the points that that's talking about, right? Inflection points at mu, plus or minus sigma. So plus sigma would be right here, minus sigma would be right there. Now basically what an inflection point is, is it's the point where a graph changes what's called its concavity. Concavity is um, what describes kind of the, the curvature or the cuppiness of the graph, if you will. Um, so if you look at this part of the graph from all the way in the left to this point, it has an upward 
cup shape. You could put things in it and they would essentially stay there. Um, that has a positive concavity. On the other hand, when you look at the right hand side, um, to the right of this inflection point here, we can see it has a downward cup shape. The cup of the graph is going down. That's negative concavity. Similarly, it's still negative concavity right here, but then as we go to the opposite side of this inflection point, the concavity becomes positive again. It has that upward cup shape to it. The inflection points are the points at which the graph changes concavity. It changes from positive to negative and then back to positive. So that's what inflection points do. So those are some of the key features of the graph and largely what, will we, what we will be doing um, with the normal curve is we will be using it to calculate normal probabilities. The area under any entire normal curve, so in other words, if you were to go infinitely left and infinitely right, follow this thing out to infinity on both sides, and find the total area under that curve, the area under any entire normal curve is equal to 1 always equal to 1. And why is this handy? Basically what we're going to do is we're going to make use of the fact that the portion of the area under the curve within a given interval represents the probability that a measurement will lie in that interval. Okay. So because the area under any normal curve is equal to 1, we can treat that curve as though it represents, the area underneath it represents the probability of falling into a particular area. Um, basically, if you go back up here, we can see that most of the area under the normal curve is certainly within two standard deviations on either side in the mean. That is the bulk of the area. There's very little uh, area out in these tails. And we can make use of that to calculate some probabilities. And so the next thing that we're going to take a look at is the empirical rule. Um, and how do we apply that?